Well, good morning. What a blessing. Praise God. It is a beautiful day that the Lord has made. Amen. We are in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We're looking at verses 3 through 16 uh, today. I'm not sure we'll get all the way through it, but I always leave it open just in case the Holy Spirit moves me faster than I normally am able to move, to be honest. <laughs> so, uh, we're looking at verse 3 is where we're going to start. Last week we began this section with an introduction, and of course the, the culture class. You know, just as I've been thinking about it, there's, such, there's been such a long war against the sexes, men uh, and women, male and female, for so long. In fact, that's what was said in Genesis uh, chapter 3, that uh, when uh, Adam and Eve fell, that there would be uh, a conflict in the home from here on out for uh, peace, for seeing eye to eye, for things going smooth, if there's going to be a conflict. And uh, Jesus was the answer that came, the healing balm for marriages, for families, for communities. Uh, wh the subject matter we address was in the same state that we're in today, if not worse. But we are rapidly moving so fast, our culture, um, in this area that uh, there's such confusion uh, that we are definitely competing with the Romans in their thoughts on the sexes because there was uh, all kinds of, of social struggle going on between men and women, even in the Roman culture. Um, modesty was an issue. Uh, in the Roman culture, uh, women uh, were known, there was a writer that wrote that uh, women were known to, to get into um, spearing pigs, and they would ride naked and throw spears at wild pigs, and it was just like this new thing that was happening in the Roman culture, and it was just a part of the uh, liberation movement. I'm not going to be under the authority of man, I'm not going to be under the authority of of anyone on my own person. And this was happening with men too. Um, Caesar had a nine-year-old wife who was a male. Okay? This was the, gov the, the leader of the Roman world. Uh, could you imagine if our president had a nine-year-old male that was giving hormone therapy to keep him young? That's what literally was happening in uh, at Nero, he married a nine-year-old. And um, so this stuff's not new. We're not addressing new things or we're not dealing with confusion that's brand new. It's, a, it's getting worse for us as a nation because we started out as a very conservative, biblical nation, uh, biblically focused. And now we've moved away from that and... Now we're, we've sown to the wind, we're reaping the whirlwind, the confusion is just as strong today as then. They're, the difference between their culture, our culture, they're an Eastern culture, we're a Western culture, our dress, we don't wear veils, we understand veils because of the uh, Islamic uh, people that have been moving into the United States. We are seeing uh, you know, headdresses and veils uh, on a regular basis now where it was very foreign for our culture at one time. And uh, so this won't be so foreign as it was maybe a few years ago to read and understand the culture that Paul is writing to. But uh, we're going to look at the principle here and the order in the church. This is what Paul is addressing, order in the church and the principle. And it's an authority issue and its focus is not men versus women. That is not the focus of this subject. The, su the focus of, the of this subject is submission to Christ. That's, that's the bottom line. And this will never be preached in the public square as accepted to all humanity. There's no way. 
In fact, just, just read the first line of chapter 3. It says, but I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. That is a true statement. That's not a subjective statement. That is not a, a statement that Paul is wishfully thinking, like, oh, it would be so nice if the head of every man was Christ. I want to, first of all, state that this is not just saying man as in the male role of our human race. No, this is all people. Christ is the head of all people. And why I think that's important that you understand that is, is you, you don't want to isolate this verse and do an eisegesis, and that is to pull strictly from this one line and analyze it, saying, well, the word man is masculine. Uh, He's using it in a broad sense because the word every, every man, the head of every man is Christ. And this is so important to understand that Christ is over all. He is all in all, everything. Philippians chapter 2, verse 9. It's always good to balance Scripture with Scripture and to see what's being taught to have of of the right perspective. Verse 9, it says in Philippians 2.9, Therefore God has also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, if there was no life after death, this statement would be ridiculous. We've known many people who have held on to their pride, who have held on to their individualism, and died in that position. I believe what I believe, I am who I am, and I will not change my view for anyone. And they've died like that. But guess what? It's not the end for them. They will come back before the Lord and before his throne at the great white throne judgment. It will be a horrifying day, a shocking day when when people thought they got away with it. I got away with it. Nobody ever found out. Nobody ever caught me. Nobody ever made me. I did it my way. And Standing in that position, they will rise up out of a sleep before the presence of the living God. And they will give an account for every idle word and for every action. They will give full account before the living God. At that point, this scripture will be absolutely true. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. There will not be an open debate on whether the man Christ Jesus is truly God. That debate will be settled. Absolutely settled. His authority will not be questioned. People will be absolutely shaken to the core. No one will hold their hard stance of resolve. All wills will be melted before the glory of the living God. That is the teaching of the Word of God, and it is not apologizing for it. It's not begging for approval. It's simply informing you and I of the reality. And so for us to ignore this reality only sets us up for a really, really bad day that will turn into eternal separation from God. Oh, we don't want to do it our way. We want to do it his way. This is the point of the text. Everybody is under authority. Everybody. This sums up, this verse just covers every human being, including Christ. You'll notice that. Keep reading. It says the head of woman is man and the head of Christ is God. 
for not even Christ when he came in his glory, in his love, in his grace, as he poured out his life and gave to the people, healing people, ministering to people, teaching people, and then gave his life for all humanity in sacrifice. Even in that, those acts of service, he did not act independently, but he was under authority. He was under the authority of God. Was he less than God in his authority? No. No, because John 10, 30 says, Jesus says, I and my Father are one. You got to take that verse at face value because that's the way it was declared. Jesus made himself to be God. The Pharisees and religious leaders of the day clearly knew and saw that Jesus was claiming to be equal with God. Therefore, they desired to kill him on multiple occasions. He was, uh, there was several stoning attempts. And what would Jesus do when they tried to stone him? He would walk through their midst as if there was no trouble at all. He just says, oh, he just walked through their midst. Well, what did that look like? Were they grabbing at the air? Did they just get confused for a moment? Like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And then, you know, where is he? What, what, you know, however he did it, he just would walk right through their midst. But he would tell them plainly, before Abraham was, I am. I mean, what a statement to say. Because he began with saying, Abraham saw my day and rejoiced. And they said, you're not yet 50. And Abraham saw you? What are you talking about? And he looked them right in the face and he said, before Abraham was, I am. That's how God introduced himself to Moses, is I am. So we're not questioning in the text here whether God the Father is greater in essence and in spirit is God the Son. They're both God, and this is the way the Bible presents Jesus as 100% God. All authority has been given to me, Jesus says. All authority has been given to me. Now you, as my disciples, go and make disciples and baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So he has given his, he's been granted authority, he has all authority, and he's granting authority to his church. So there's an order in authority, and it's God as head. In fact, Paul makes the statement in Philippians that after everything is placed under Jesus' feet, all authority has been given to him. After he sits at the right hand of the Father, as he sits at the right hand of the Father, God is going to place everything under his feet. And he says, of course, that leaves God the Father exempt. Jesus will then hand everything to his Father that God may be glorified. God is Jesus. God is God the Father. And we're just going to have to deal with it because um, my brain hurts the more I talk about it does every time. It's way too small to deal with such matters in this life and probably in the next because God is God. And until uh, he'll always be God. <laughs> All right. But this is what Jesus said about God the Father. John 14, verse 28. You have heard me say to you, I am going away and coming back to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said, I'm going to the Father, for my Father is greater than I. You see, Jesus later, he says, actually earlier than this, um, he says that nothing that he says is of his own authority, that everything he speaks is straight from the Father through the Spirit. Everything. He was in total submission to the will of the Father. It was absolutely manifested in the cross. Jesus was at the Garden of Gethsemane. He was in prayer. He was crying out to the Lord. And he said, Father, if there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, 
but your will be done. It's an authority issue. It's an authority issue. He submitted himself to the will of the Father. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son. So Jesus, in his most desperate moment as a human being, cries out to the Father for strength and says, Lord, I don't want to do this in this moment. If there's any other way that, that humanity could be saved, let it be. But there was no other way, so he submitted for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. He learned obedience, Hebrews tells us, by the things that he suffered. It was through his suffering, the things that he didn't want to do. How do you know when you're truly submissive? When you don't want to do something, right? It's easy to be obedient to parents. It's easy to be obedient to authority, to the laws of the land when they're convenient, when they're inconvenient, Jesus was tested in his obedience by the things that he suffered at, at the will of the Father. Remember Isaiah chapter... Um, whew, wow, brain phase. Isaiah... ...his sacrifice that it pleased the Father to bruise him. Because through him, many would be saved. So there was actually a, a delight in the Father because he knew the fruit. And that's right to say, why, why would he do it? If you're sovereign, if you could put a stop to it, why would you allow it? Because there was purpose. There was purpose. There was meaning in his suffering. And is that we're under authority and it begins with God and Christ as our example and the head of the church. What we covered last week is we're to emulate Christ. We're to follow Christ. He is our example and he humbled himself and he submitted himself to the will of the Father. What has always been an encouragement to me because, look, submission is an issue for every single one of us. Okay, let's not pretend like it's only women who have to submit. Holy moly. I've never been the, uh, the boss at work, like the boss, boss, boss. And you know what? I've never felt that I'm the boss here for a moment. Actually, on the contrary, I feel like I'm at the bottom of the pyramid. <laughs> One wrong move and all the masters will leave. <laughs> That's wrong thinking, just so you know. It's got to be God. I got to serve God and just serve the Lord by serving whoever is in front of me, but serve him as according to the Lord and under his authority. And, and so I don't feel like I'm the boss here. There's a young guy in our church who says, you're the boss here. I'm like, no. <laughs> nope, I'm not. There's a lot happens here that I just trust God with. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, okay, Lord, we're just yours. I have no idea what to do. I don't feel like I'm the boss in the home. I feel like I'm the servant in the home. Why? Because we're called to lead according to Christ who served. He says, I have not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life a ransom. The more I've learned about leadership is the more accountable you are to serve. Servant leadership is the call. It's not a worldly leadership that we're called to. And so... Christ is our example in leadership. He submitted to God and did the will of the Father who was leading and guiding his life. And you and I are submitting to God through Christ who's leading and guiding our lives. That's men and women alike. We all, and, and I do stress this because look at how um, just... Hitting on that point again, uh, this is how Paul says it in Ephesians 5. Same idea. Remember, let's just reread it in chapter 1 Corinthians 11.3. It says, the head of every man is Christ. Well, every man, is that just talking about men? Maybe here in the context, the focus is, is man and the, as head of home or as head in culture, 
uh, in the culture, but the, the idea or the reality is we're all under Christ. And look at how Ephesians 5.23 says it. He says, For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. So Paul is setting a tone in his teaching. Look, Christ is our head. And this is how you're to lead, like Christ leads. And this is how you're to follow, like Christ followed. And you might say, well, Christ, he had to follow God who was perfect. He knew God's will was perfect. Have you ever tried to follow an imperfect person who has just a idiotic idea and you know it? It's like, wow, that's the most idiotic thing I've ever heard. And I'm supposed to submit to that idea? Hey, we've all experienced it at some point in our life. As a child, with our parents, we've experienced it as an adult in the workplace or in the home. Men and women, we all know we have plenty of power with each other. When you get married, oh, you're both so vulnerable. If one of you decides to go AWOL, it gets ugly fast. What happened to the bank account? The money's just gone. Oh, no idea. Why is your suitcase packed? What are you talking about? Why is the car running? People have seen those days. Suddenly their world just drove away. And how am I supposed to pay the bills? You just took off with all the money. You see, marriage is an adult. It's, it's, it's an adult reality. It's, it's no one's puffed out chest. I'm in charge. Listen to me. If you have that attitude, good luck. You won't be married long. We're to submit to one another. We're to minister to one another. We're to serve one another. And if you married someone that's not like that, I'm sorry. That's a hard situation. But God is setting in an order in the home as well as in the church that is under Christ. He's always the authority. Uh, I think, you know, there, there's, uh, there's different personalities. Some people really struggle with following, and they just always want to be in charge, no matter what. And they have trouble keeping jobs, and they have trouble keeping marriages together, and they have trouble having kids love them. You know, the kids get old enough and they split and they never look back. Why? Because you were so domineering. They couldn't breathe in your presence. And so they're like, I'm so out of here. There's personalities like that. On the other hand, there are personalities so soft, they could never make a decision for themselves. Right? It's like, you decide. Whatever, whatever you want, kids. If you don't want to go to school today, you, you want tricks, Breakfast, lunch, and dinner, okay, as long as you're happy. You know, I, I'm telling you, I know people like that. There's, there's both extremes, right? And so this, this order thing is hard to swallow for anybody in this culture. And if you put the, the blanket statement over this, this, this reality that the Christ is the head of every man, how is the world doing in that department? Look at that. Most of the world doesn't even accept Christ as being anything in their life. And yet he is. So there's space for individualism and rebellion and doing it the way you want to do it, isn't there? And that still carries true in the church. The command to us to be under the authority of Christ is a decision that God has given us in this life. It's you choose. And Joshua said it to the children of Israel, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether it be the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, or the, God of the, the gods of, the, of your fathers from across the flood. And that was on the other side of the Jordan River. They had just crossed over the Jordan River when it was flooded. And he's pointing back to Ur of the Chaldees and to where Abraham was from. He says, they served other gods. You choose you this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's our decision. You've got to decide. And so Paul is saying, look, if you're a Christian, you're a believer, you call yourself the Lord's, then 
This is what you're signing up for. Christ is your head. He is in authority. And everything else is subject to Christ. This woman, new believer, uh, started going to church. Her husband was not a Christian. Did not like the idea of her loving another man. You love Jesus? He was trying to wrap his mind around it. And anyway, one day, he, they were in an argument over the whole thing. And he was just kind of, his frustration was mounting with this whole religious thing and this thing that was going on in her life. And he was drunk. And he grabbed his, he picked up his gun. He was tired of seeing her just walking out the door. He picked up his gun, he pointed at her, and he says, you go to church, I'm going to shoot you. She looked square down the barrel of the gun right at her husband and said, if you pull that trigger, I'm going to be with Jesus. And if you don't pull that trigger, I'm going to church. And she turned around and walked away. <laughs> that's pretty powerful. You know, that's a bold statement. But you know what? That's where she was at. This is my conviction. You're not changing my course. This is where God is leading me. This is what God has going on with me. Was that wrong? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. So understand the role in the home is always subject to Christ. Husband says, Look, drive the getaway car, dear. We need money. Let me pray about that. You want me to drive you to the bank? You're going to come running out with a bag of money as fast as you can, and I'm supposed to drive as fast as I can you away. Does God want me to participate in this? No. God would agree that you should disobey, and so would the state. <laughs> they would say, you know, that was a bad decision listening to your husband there. So obviously there's boundaries for all of us in all of this. The same goes for at work. You know, I was talking to a couple that uh, ended up in jail because they stepped into, in the 2008, the housing market and the, all, everything that was going on, and they were so excited to be in the realty business, and they were making buco bucks, but somewhere along the line, they became accountable to what they were doing was not on the up and up. And often people, when seeing a bunch of money flooding into their bank account, will say, who cares? <laughs> this is amazing. Maybe we'll get away with this. And they didn't. And they ended up in jail, you know, accountable for what they did. So at work, you're still accountable, right? Between wrong and right. Nobody owns you. We're blessed in America. We are blessed. Most of us are free. I say most of us because there are children who feel like slaves growing up in our land. There are women who feel like slaves. They don't have a better option or decision than to be under the power of, uh, of someone else. There's probably men too, but fewer. But this is a real issue. And so it begins with Christ and the lordship of Christ in our lives. 1 Corinthians 3.23 says, you are Christ's, and Christ is God's. There it is. That's the sum of it. You are Christ's, and Christ is God's. So, man is the head of woman. Let's talk about it. This is important. He goes on to say that every man from every man is Christ's. The head of every man is Christ. The head of woman is man. I want you to notice a change in gram, uh, the grammatic here, the, the, a grammatical change. Let me get that out right. And it is singular. Man is singular. Woman is singular. This is not talking about Women being subjected to men. That is not the statement. That is not the doctrine. That is not the teaching. It is, if you are married, woman, you are a picture of Christ in his submission to the Father. And he lived in balance with that idea. Oh, but Christ, God was perfect and my husband isn't. Yeah, 
Good argument. Good argument. As Jesus was growing up, he was in the temple at 12 years old. His mom, his stepdad, they come in, and they find him in the temple, and they're reprimanding him. Where were you? Why, why didn't you stay with the, with the family? Why did you stay here when we were going home? And he said, did you not know I must be about my father's business? And they took that to heart. Mary, it says, really took that to heart, pondered that in her heart, like, wow, okay. But this is what it says. He submitted himself unto his parents, and he went home with them. And the next mention, he's 30 years old. Jesus submitted himself unto his parents. Those were imperfect people that didn't always make the right decision. And yet, he lived till he was 30 in the family and submitting in the family and working alongside of the family and being a family man. He knows what it is to live this life and to face the challenges that we face. And so... What a blessing that you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, you can go to any one of us for anything we're facing and say, Lord, what do I do? I need your help. What do I do? I need your help. And God will give you an answer. There's uh, this statement right here is made most clear... um, Actually, before I go to that thought, Galatians 3.28... I wanted to begin with, this is not a preferential or who's better than. This is not a who's better than question. Well, you're more talented than I, than you lead. That's not how the Lord set it up. The Lord has set it up that we both depend, as a couple, we both depend on the Lord. And by depending on the Lord we both will be led in the roles that he's given us. And yes, there's going to be seasons where you don't agree. The worst uh, time, I think, for Amy and I that we ever went through, that God really gave us the grace through it, is we didn't agree on where we should live. We were living on Catalina, and she wanted to move yesterday, and I was like, nope, God hasn't given me the okay. From what I understand and how God got us here, he hasn't given me the okay to leave, and it was for, uh, I don't know, she'd be tell you how long it was, at least a year and a half to two years, that every time the subject came up, there was such tension in the room. To keep it civil, you had to walk away, and sometimes we didn't. Sometimes we just would have it out, just talking through it, because it was just, she was suffering so bad in the situation. It was a bad situation, and yet... I felt that the situation was bad on both of us and that it was from the Lord and that we just had to keep going through it. And in that, it was difficult. But here, let me read the verse. It's, when I'm emotional about something, you'll find I'm all over the place. So God bless you and you're listening. Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor fe- female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. How beautiful is that? Christ has declared us equal. He has declared us one. We are equal in the eyes of the Lord. Soul for soul, every human being on this planet is priceless to the living God. No matter your talent, no matter your your beauty or lack of beauty, no matter your financial status, no matter your nationality, it does not matter. Every single soul matters pricelessly to to the living God. That is his standard. That is his heart. That's the way he sees it and looks at it. And as we step into him, we are loved so incredibly. The love God has for us is unmeasurable. And when I sit in his love, I am most satisfied. I find satisfaction in joy no matter what my circumstances are. How can I be thankful in everything? Because in everything, give thanks 
for this is the will of God. It didn't say be thankful for everything. It said in everything. So if you're sitting in the mud, find something to be thankful for. If you're sitting on a palace throne, be thankful, be thankful, and give glory to God. This is the focus of our lives is, Lord, you've saved me eternally. No matter what happens, no matter how dark it gets, no matter how much loss I experience in this life, I'm going to be with you really soon. I'm going to be in your presence. So we have been made equal, but our roles and how we witness and testify to the living God is different. There is different roles in the church. For he made apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Why? For the edification of the body, for the building up of the body of Christ. That each one may be mature and ready for the good works that God has called them to in their salvation. God saved you for good works. He saved you to work and minister to the body of Christ. The uh, acronym JOY, Jesus, Others, You. I said it last week, I forget, I don't think I said it for service. But JOY, you find JOY in serving Jesus, in serving others, and then in taking care of your own needs. In fact, trusting the Lord to take care of your own needs. Because I find my needs are best met when I'm serving Jesus and others. He just seems to use others to take care of me. Like my wife, so often, I'll be putting so much energy out in, at work or so much energy out work here, and she'll just take care of the home. And amazing, just to come home to have this nice little beautiful nest to come land in. And it didn't look like the same way I left it. Because I have problems with my socks. I don't know where they go. Every day I... And uh, everything else, to be honest. I mean, Amy collects my stuff out of the living room, out of the bathroom, out of the hallway. She's like, really? The hallway? I was coming down the hallway, changing into Superman. That's what I do, you know? <laughs> you get the picture. Um, no, you don't want the picture. Um, <laughs> Ephesians 5.23, I think we already read this. For husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Wives are to minister to their families. And, you know, one thing in this dynamic that I had to learn for, it took me a long time to get this. It's so hard, you know, you're teaching young men these principles, and they get so little in life, they've not been under... A, uh, an authority uh, structure very long, and they just get this idea that dad is supreme boss of the home, and that's what I want to be when I grow up. That was my attitude, poor Amy. Um, I just thought, you know, you married me to be my helpmate, and I'll let you know if you're being helpful. <laughs> we, we had big fights, and it wasn't her fault. <laughs> Well, in the midst of all that, you know, I learned how that, first of all, Amy's an adult. Uh, she's not my child, and I'm not going to ever treat her like a child. And what I learned was I would go to work, and this is just everyday stuff. I just share random stuff through life. I, I would come home, and the kids would hit me with decisions. Hey, Dad, can I do this? Hey, Dad, can I do that? And of course, I had no idea what was going on. And if I stupidly answered their questions right there on the spot, because I'm in charge oh, I would find out that they just played me beautifully. You know, they had done something wrong. Mom said they couldn't go to their friend's house that night because they had done this. They come walking out, hey, yeah, can you drive me to my friend's house right now? Like, right now, real quick. <laughs> Let's talk to mom and see what's going on. I learned, hey, check in with the boss. And I mean that. Amy would run the home. I'm not there. How am I supposed to run the home? A good leader knows how to delegate. I put her in charge of the home. So when the kids would come and say, come on, Dad, it's your decision. You're the boss. Make a decision. I'd go, yeah, I decided to let Mom decide. <laughs> That's the safest. So we'd sit down and we'd talk. If we didn't have time to talk, you make the call. You know what's going on with those kids. 
You have a way better pulse on it than I do. I'm gone at work all day. And I think it's so important that you just think these things through, men, as you never, ever pull this on your wife. Never. Hey, uh, God made me in charge. Just want to remind you. Oh, did you want to die today? <laughs> did, you, did you want to put your marriage on the permanent rocks like right now? You know, why? Because your obedience to Christ is between you and Christ, and he works on your relationship with you, right? When you get out of line, he disciplines you. He chastens you. Your wife's not there telling you, yeah, at work. She's not, like, following you around. I'm going to make sure you're following Christ every moment, every day, doing your job, doing what you're supposed to do. No, Christ is over you. And, men, that's how it is in the home. So then how do you lead? You lead in prayer. I find when I'm praying for my family, God's giving my wife wisdom. God's touching my kids and giving them wisdom. It's incredible when I lead in prayer. And then God will give opportunity husband and wife to connect, figure out what's going on in life, especially on the big decisions. And I learned the Lord will lead us both. You know, the Lord led both Amy and I out to Catalina together. We went through a rough spot there, but he led us off the island together. She didn't leave without me. God bless her. When we moved there, we moved into a tent, okay? A camping tent, I'm not joking. Three months in a camping tent, a year and a half, in a 10 by 10 little shack with the bathroom across the buffalo pasture, and I'm not even joking. It was a buffalo pasture. 20 buffalo lived between us and the bathroom all winter long. Outdoor showers. It was crazy, and I had three kids. A two-year-old, I know. You guys are thinking, why am I even listening to this quack? It was God. He called us. It was Southern California. Let's not get too dramatic. You know, a freezing winter. It's 65. I don't know what I'm going to do. I might have to put on pants. I'm tired of my trunks. The Lord blessed us with where we were, but it was a hard season, especially for Amy when the kids get sick. All of that. It was so tough. But you know what? The Lord got our eyes on him. I mean, we just got so close to the Lord in that season. It was incredible. I, I wouldn't trade it. I really wouldn't. I needed a good rough beating. I mean, and it was. I knew I was responsible to take care of, but how do you think Joseph felt when he couldn't put Mary and Jesus in a, a motel or a house? They're born in a man he's born in a manger, you know, laid in a manger in a stable. I mean, come on. God puts us in those situations so we get our eyes on him. And we call out to him. And it was such a good season for us. But it was unified when we moved off the island. It was unified when we moved off the island. And it was unified when we got here. And it's been unified. And we've had our friction points with schooling the kids. Do you homeschool? Do you send them to public school? Do you send them to a Christian school? It's been a challenge all the way through at moments, but it's such a blessing to be able to come together, hear one another out, and decide how we're making those decisions. And now, let me just give you how it works. This is, this is how, this is important you understand this, especially you ladies, because how I decided with Amy is, that, man, when she felt super strong about something, I didn't fight her on it. She's an adult. She really wanted to get a, a, a car at a certain time. She gave me all her reasons why she, we needed that car. I didn't think we could afford it, but we went for it. We, we ended up affording it. It was really great. It ended up being a really good decision. I was glad I let her take the lead on that. But I understood this. I'm wearing the responsibility. That's what it means to be the leader. Uh, let, me, let me give you a biblical example. Moses... Um, was in the wilderness for 40 years, and him and his wife, uh, he married there in the wilderness, and when God called him to go to Egypt, he was heading to Egypt with his wife and his kids. He had two kids. But he hadn't circumcised his sons like the Jews were supposed to, according to Abraham. God gave that covenant to Abraham. He hadn't circumcised his children 
And I'm reading into the text, but I'm telling you, coming from a home that's had conflict, I think this makes total sense. His wife was a Midianite, and she was not going to have it. You are not laying a knife to my son's loins. That is not cool. And my little guy needs to be protected. I'm the mother. I will protect my child. And so Moses didn't circumcise his kids. Why do I say that? Because on the way, it says that God pinned Moses to the ground and was going to kill him. And what happens? Like It's out of the blue. Suddenly he's pinned to the ground and he's going to die. And it's because he hadn't obeyed the Lord. He was going to lead the people into the receiving of the law and he hadn't kept the law himself. And so what happens? This is why I think his wife was in on it, on this whole argument, because she circumcised. She, while her husband's pinned to the ground, circumcises both boys, throws the foreskins at her husband, and says, you are a bloody husband to me. But she did it because God was going to kill her husband. That's how authority works. Look, her decision is your decision. You wear it. You own it. On the day of judgment, you will stand there before God. And you say, did you do what I said? Now, that's between you and the Lord. So when you're in a, a stalemate, you don't know what to do, you can't make a decision together, you go to God and you say, God, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to honor you here. I don't know what your will is. I feel like it's this, but I'm not totally sure. Could you please guide me? Could you please lead me? And watch what he does. Some things slow, develop slower than others. But this is important stuff, and this carries into the church. And we're out of time. But we're laying foundations. We're, I feel like we're climbing upstairs. And I think it's a tough staircase to climb with our culture because our culture doesn't like authority, period. But we're building from God to authority in Christ, to authority in the home that carries over into the church. Because the church is a bunch of homes that get together. Okay? And why would we have the head of the homes be the men in position, not even in talent, it's in position. And may, may God give the men wisdom in how to lead and lead respectfully and let the wife's talents shine. Let her do what she's been called to do. But in that, when we come together and we're all sitting together, why then would we take a woman who's submissive in the home and make her head of the church? Do you see what I'm saying? It's not an issue. I, I think one pastor was asked, have you ever thought about women being pastors? And he says, never, not, never. I've never thought of that. Why? Because the Bible's really clear on it. Amen. There's, there's an order. But here's the blessing here that we're getting to, and I'm just wrapping up, but I just feel bad that I don't want to leave you on a, a hanging on this text, like, where are we headed? This is about the assembly of the church and how to properly have order in the church. And what he's summing up is women, it's fine for Amy to be up here and pray. It's fine for her to be up here and give announcements and talk. That's what this text is talking about. What do you do in the church how do women act in the church? In a submissive role. I think she's submissive. That I don't feel her usurping or pushing me out of the way at all. She's doing exactly what I want her to do. I, I, it's, we're in agreement. Let's put it that way. We're in agreement. And he's talking about when a woman prays or prophesies. And we're going to get to that. We're going to get to the whole veil or the head covering thing. Cultural. And I'm going to walk you through the uh, scriptures on that and I don't want to hurry through it but we're not coming back to this for a few weeks we have Palm Sunday, we have Easter and then we'll come back to this text after that and uh, we'll do a quick refresher and jump in with all of that but uh, Father thank you so much for your precious word it's all about you Jesus if we don't have our eyes on you our homes are already a mess It's how can we have order in our lives when our lives are out of disorder with you, when we're out of order with you, we can't expect to have order anywhere else. 
And Lord, that's why this world is so messed up and confused. So Lord, please help us start with you. Align ourselves with you and your will for our lives. And see how faithful your hand is and how wise you are and gentle. And may we lead like you, Jesus, the way you love us and lead us. That's how we're to lead parents leading children like Jesus leads parents. And husbands leading wives just like Jesus leads you, husband. Oh, how sweet it is. Moms directing and guiding and training up your children just the way Jesus has directed, guided, and trained you. Oh, Lord, it's so good. It's so good to be yours. Father, teach us your ways. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.